So uh, in week one, we looked at mostly translations and, and the interpretive journey. Uh, last week, we looked at different things to uh, pay attention to while you're going through that interpretive journey. Um, you know, the more specifics of it, like repetition of words and that kind of stuff. And tonight, we're going to look at more of some of the dangers that can come in Bible studies, uh, why it's important to pay attention to the context, and uh, really a, a very, very basic form of how to do word studies. And the reason for that is because to do a good Bible, a word study in the Bible, you really have to, it's a whole process, and we wouldn't be able to really talk enough about it. So I just wanted to skim through it. Um, so the four stages of Bible study, um, it will be there on the screen. Uh, you want to understand it then and there. What did it originally mean? Then uh, the second thing, the next step in the process, you want to see what's different, what's changed. How, how big of differences are there between them and us? Uh, step three, you want to kind of find the similarities. You want to uh, f discover what the principle is, the underlying principle. And then you want to bring it, step four, into here and now. So here and, not, and now application, it's more like um, there are uncountable infinite amounts of applications, but there's only going to be like one principle. So if you're, if you're talking real broad terms, um, you're probably closer to a principle. If you're talking about a specific situation like um, God can do this, that would be more of an application. Uh, if you're talking then and there, you need to make sure that whatever you are observing in the text is centered around them there. Paul said to the church at Ephesus this. It's about them there. If you're making an application, it needs to be about us. God wants us to know from Ephesians and so on and so forth. So uh, with step one, then and there, you want to understand what it meant to them. You want to pay attention to specifics. And uh, that's all that I really want to say for now uh, while we go and look at the handout that I gave you last week. Um, it's on Romans chapter 12. And I was going to have... Uh, I was going to have, uh, you know, kind of talk back and forth with this, uh, but I'm afraid I used up a little too much time, so we're just going to try and get us back on track. In your um, your folder, uh, you should have it from last week, the passage from Romans. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I said Romans. First Timothy. Um, sorry about that. First Timothy 6, 17 through 19. It was that little handout I gave you last week. Um, and this is what it says. It says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. If you've noticed on your, on your, on your page how it has separated the text, it actually is kind of helpful if you do that sometimes. Um, in fact, sometimes when you are having a hard time with a certain um, verse, if you just get on your computer and kind of change out how, it, how it's typed, and what I mean by that is like change it into paragraph lines, it can sometimes be a little bit easier. Not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So if you'll notice, there's some repetition here. The first line of verse 17 and the first line of verse 18 is the exact same command. It kind of draws attention to itself. Um, and if you compare those two, you've got command those who are rich in this present world. And then in 18, you have command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. So the idea is instead of wealth on earth, you're building up wealth in heaven. Um, the next thing is... Um, notice that there's a contrast between here and now and the future. Uh, for instance, verse 17 starts off, command those who are rich in this present age, but then you get down to verse 19, it says, 
as um, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So you see a little bit of a contrast there. Um, next, you see uh, rich is repeated quite a few times. Command those who are rich in this present um, world. Uh, and then some other words associated with, with richness, like wealth. Um, who uh, The fourth line on your sheet, who richly provides us. So you're having kind of an idea that's being expounded on. These people are rich in wealth. God richly um, provides. And then you get to uh, verse 18, the, to be rich in good deeds. So you have like this, the same idea of being rich, just expressed in different ways. Um, and also, if you notice, when the word rich is used, he's using it of different persons. So God richly gives, then the people, some of the people in the church are rich. Um, they should be rich in well. I mean, sorry, in, in good deeds. So you have like the same idea, just being used different. Another thing we can observe here is that nowhere in this verse, these verses, I should say, does he command against wealth. Um, a lot of times you hear people saying that to be rich as a Christian is a, is a you know, a, a big no-no or whatever. People often say um, money is the root of all evil. No, <laughs> no. But the text actually says the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Money is not is not evil. So uh, if you notice here, he doesn't say anything. And that, that's kind of pointed because, once again, you can't do too much with an argue, argument from silence. An argument from silence is where it doesn't say something. So you don't want to build too much of an argument from an argument of silence. But it is kind of important that he never once condemns people who are wealthy, rather just redirects them. So, um, yeah. Uh, he, he does address the attitudes and the affections. Look at those. Commanders who are rich in this present world, the first thing he says, not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. That's entirely about their attitude. Entirely. So then you get down to verse 18, and he says, rather to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. So here you have, he, he, he addresses their attitudes, he addresses their, their affections, but he doesn't command against wealth. Um, next, um, notice how he draws a uh, contrast between wealth and God, between um, how we view money versus how we view God. In verse 17 it says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. And then the very next line he says, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. So you see how he's kind of contrasting the two. And this is all the observation is. You're going through a text... And you're observing what it says about itself, what it meant to them back then. So these are all things that that um, you can just notice from from doing it. And I have more, but I think that you kind of get the point that I'm trying to make. When, whenever you're trying to understand a passage, you just start right there, just like that, making observations. Um, notice how they those words were repeated. These are all things we talked about last week. So you had um, hope was repeated, rich. Uh, was repeated. We had contrast and comparisons. You had all those things. So then after you spend a good deal of time on those verses, you'd want to read the book itself. Uh, Timothy's not that not that long, so it'd be like a, if you're a slow reader, a couple hours. But if you're a fast reader, we're talking about like 30 minutes. So it's one of those things where you're kind of just trying to get the overall flow of what's being said. <clears throat> so there's, there's a story... Um, that I was that, that's in this book here, grasping God's word, and he tells a story about how he went into missions in Ethiopia, and while he was there, they did a Christmas pageant. Now we've all seen Christmas pageants; they're about 15 minutes long. You've got the kids in the front. You know, it basically has something to do with the manger. Um, maybe one of the kids will say a line. You've got usually got one of them dressed up like Joseph, and maybe one of them is dressed up like a sheep or something like that. All, all fairly regular, uh, but in this one, it first off, it was two hours long, <laughs> a two-hour-long pageant. Uh, second off, uh, it doesn't start with them at the major. It starts with them getting ready to leave for the trip. So the 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 they have like a crier basically who is uh, you know saying, hey, there's a census that needs to be taken, and so they're they're getting their stuff together and going through all this hassle. 
you know, and loading up the camels and everything is getting kind of, uh, kind of taking a long time. Then you've got this whole group of people that travel with them. And in our version, we typically just have Joseph and Mary traveling on a camel. I mean, that's typically all that's there. And so then when they get there, um, first off, there's all this different people who are there with them, family and whatnot. Um, Joseph is outside, and Mary is inside with a group of midwives, just a bunch of them. And uh, when she has the baby, they do this, like, I think it's called ululations or whatever, you know, the cries, like, ah, you know. Because in Ethiopia, that's what you do to announce a joyous occasion, like a birth of a child, for instance. And uh, these are all so different from the way that we would do ours. And the point that I'm trying to make here is, in our head, we get these little ideas of how something was. And this is what we're going to refer to as pre-understanding. So the, the biggest danger to your Bible study is pre-understanding. Pre-understanding is the ideas that we bring. When we go to a text, when we go to a part of Scripture, we bring ideas of what it must have been like or what we've heard of it being like or whatever. Maybe you heard a sermon about it or a lesson about it. Maybe you just have experience in your life. Whatever. And without even thinking about it, you're going you're gonna to in include that idea into what you're reading in the Bible. Whatever that idea is. Um, a, a good example is the whole thing with, um, with the, the birth of Jesus. We don't think of anybody traveling with Joseph and Mary because that's not how we would do that. See what I mean? We just have it in our heads a certain way. But for the people in Ethiopia who were putting on that two-hour-long pageant, they couldn't possibly imagine jo uh, Mary traveling as a pregnant woman without having midwives with, them, with her. They just can't even imagine that. And so that's something that they brought to the text unintentionally. And uh, when you, whenever you read the text, you're going to bring that. So I'll give you some examples right off the top of my head. Um, when we think of Christmas, we think of songs that are part of our culture, like Silent Night, Holy Night. All, you know, those kinds of ideas. And the Christmas songs that we sing have little ideas in them that make us think that's how it was. It was a silent night, even though there were a bunch of people traveling, even though a baby was just born and babies scream. Somewhere in here we have it that there was a silent night. So I mean? And nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just you need to be aware when the Bible actually says something and when it's just something that we are pre-understanding. Um, another example is everybody knows that we all get a mansion in heaven, even though the text does not say we get a mansion in heaven. It says this, in my Father's house. So that this is something that's going to happen in a house. Okay, hard be hard to have a bunch of mansions in a house, right? <laughs> so in my Father's house, there is a, I will go and prepare a room for you, a place for you. The idea is, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but the idea is that we're going to have a family, an eternal home. It's not that we're going to have a mansion. <laughs> I'm going to go to my mansion because I'm tired of dealing with you, you people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, I, I'm all found, funned out, Jesus. I'm going to go pout in my house now. It's not the idea that's trying to get across. But in our culture, the idea of a mansion is so ingrained that we are all convinced. Now, I know that some of you are going to go home and say, I know it's in here somewhere. It's a, it's a translation from the King James is what it is. Once again, I already explained why I don't like the King James and all the issues that there are there. But anyways, it's just something that is part of our culture now. Uh, the next danger to studying is simply pride. And it, it, pride says this. My view on this passage is definitely right. I've got it figured out. I won't listen. I know. And we're going to talk about another, another danger called familiarity. And it's very much so connected with being too familiar with it. But it goes beyond being familiar with a passage. You're just convinced that when you study it or when you read it, the way I understood that to mean that's how it is. I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow the potential that I might have uh, read that passage wrong. You know, maybe, maybe I do need to change about this. Um, it's one of those things where it gets to be a little bit dangerous because God can't show you new things if you're constantly protective of my, you know, I have all full understanding. Uh, it's one of those things we have to constantly challenge yourself. Uh, so the third danger is simply agenda. So for this, this is where you already know what you believe. <laughs> Don't confuse me with the facts. I've got my mind made up. So the... the 
this is where you go to the Bible and you want it to prove what you already believe. This is what I believe and I want it to prove it. So uh, I'll give you a couple different examples about this. Um, the first is the evolution and creation debate, right? Everybody wants to talk about evolution and creation. So then, of course, where else to go to except for Genesis? Um, and so then they, they make Genesis um, about their argument. People who believe in evolution, they try to translate it to support that. People who believe in creationism try to interpret it to do that. Meanwhile, Genesis was actually written to show us God's character. So a good, a good example of this, in all the ancient belief systems, the creation of the world was, first of all, it tended to be a little bit dirtier. Um, the gods would, you know, have... You know, and that would cause plants to grow and life to grow and all that stuff. And uh, another big theme you see in the ancient world is the idea of gods wrestling. Creation was done either on accident or the gods were, you know, fighting and this is what was left over. Uh, one of them, I think it's Tiamat, is killed and she becomes the sky. And, you know, so there's all these different ideas there. Then you get to Genesis, and this is what it said. In the beginning... No argument, no fight, no nothing. God the Eternal spoke and there was. That's what you get in Genesis. There's no, there's no sexual undertones at all with the creation. He doesn't do anything with the creation. He simply speaks and it is. He doesn't fight any other gods, nothing like that. You have God the All-Powerful doing this amazing thing. And that's what we have. We have him creating everything. And that's, that's the point of Genesis. And uh, I think nowadays we kind of, well, I think we lose that because we're too caught up in our modern day arguments. Not to say that the Bible doesn't have anything to do with our modern arguments, but you have to understand it wasn't written to our modern audience. It was written to an ancient world. And if you don't understand what it meant back then, you know, I can understand what it means now. And uh, so I think it's just a, a, a big mistake. Typically speaking, science more addresses um, how things happen, and the Bible more addresses why things happen. Like science can tell us, oh, when the wind blows, this is what's happening. But the Bible tells us, this is why the wind blows. See what I mean? It, the Bible is more concerned with, it's not concerned with simply making observations about the natural world. It's interested in teaching us things about the eternal. And it points us towards that. Why else would God mention the day of rest, which, by the way, had no ending? Days one through six, they all had an ending. Day seven never had an ending. Why in the world would God describe a day that had no ending where there was rest? Unless he also included, wanted to include us in that rest. Then you get to the book of law and he talks about the time of rest. Then you get to the prophets where he's talking about the, the coming rest, the coming Sabbath. Then you get to Jesus where he's talking about, you, you guys, it's not about a day of the week. You're, you're missing the whole thing. And then you get to, the, to Revelation, and you've got this idea that's all throughout Scripture of the coming day of rest. That's a, a spiritual principle that Genesis 1 is trying to show us that, you know, we've kind of forgotten. So, the Bible is above simple, petty arguments that we have in our culture. Um, and, other, and some other things that, that we kind of have an agenda that we uh, take, uh, make Scripture kind of address is... Well, God wants me to be happy. So since God wants me to be happy, I'm going to interpret everything that I read as God wants me to be happy. And if there's anything that I read that fractures that idea, I'm going to dismiss it and just not focus on that scripture. See what I mean? And we all do it to a certain extent, so I'm not trying to pick on anybody. Um, another idea that we uh, kind of set as an agenda. Well, God won't ever give me more than I can handle. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he does, actually, and his Bible says, his word says that he will. So, you know, probably go to the scriptures with the idea of, I could always be wrong. I could always be wrong. So let's see what the Bible has to say to me, and how can I be corrected. In the book of Habakkuk, there's this interesting, interesting line. Habakkuk is complaining about, about how God is handling a situation. Then he says this, after he's done complaining, he says, I'm going to paraphrase here, he says, now... I'm going to sit here waiting for you to tell me, where, where am I wrong? What am I getting wrong here? And the idea that he has is one of humility. Like, hey, I, I'm not understanding this. This doesn't seem right to me. 
if <laughs> I wouldn't do that like this if I were you. So can you, ex- like, not explain to me, but can you correct me? Show me where I'm wrong. And uh, just an interesting uh, line there. So then we get to uh, the next danger of steady familiarity. This is really similar to pride, but it's more about, oh, I already know. There's nothing for me here. I can skip this part of the Bible because there's, there's nothing for me here. I, wrote, I once taught a lesson entirely um, on the genealogies in Genesis. It did not include anything but the genealogies. And there's a lot of powerful stuff there that, once again, we don't pay attention to because we just try to get through them as quickly as we can. I mean, what are these, are these people in these times? And I'll probably talk about them eventually. But, you know, uh, my point being, uh, don't write something off just because you've read it a whole bunch of times. Um, hmm. So when you get to this kind of an attitude of familiarity, you are ensuring that there isn't anything for you. When you go to a, a passage in, in the Bible and say, nope, I already know everything there is here, I'm just going to skip it. All that you're doing is you're guaranteeing that there won't be anything there for you because you're not reading it. As long as you read it, there, you can find something there. Uh, and then the next, uh, the next danger is that of simply the effects of the culture, the way that the culture... Um, impacts us without us even thinking. We are definitely a, a, a result of culture. Um, not to say that God can't speak through that, but we need to be aware of the fact that we do have blind spots uh, in our belief system. Um, in, in America, for, in, for instance, the idea of love is very confused. And uh, when you talk about what is love, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, and I'm not trying to get on a high horse here. It's just in our culture, a lot of things are confused. Um, I, I was, I was, uh, I'm aware of uh, Matt Walsh. I don't typically watch him, but he was um, made a documentary about what is a woman. And one thing that you continually saw in that documentary is, I, I don't know what a woman is. I, I'm just not sure, you know. And then, okay, so what is love? I, I don't know. For a lot of us, we know that love at least has something to do with a feeling. In our culture, love is acceptance, it's affirmation, it's non-judgmental, it's comfort. It's more of an idea. Um, it's not really something you can really tie down in our culture. Once again, I'm not saying that that's a right view. I'm just saying that, that in our culture is what it is. It's, it's about, if you love me, you're going to accept me. You're going to affirm me. You're never going to be judgmental of me. How, what you see is what you, what you get. You're going to just accept that, and I'm going to feel comfortable. Um, you can see how that's very um, me-focused. And then if you contrast that with what the Bible says about love, in a lot of ways it's very severely lacking. Uh, in most ways, I'll say. Uh, and then there's different various American ideals that may or may not skew how we read a passage. I'm not going to say that any of these are right or wrong. I'm just going to say these are American ideals that can affect how we read the Bible. So nobody stone me. <laughs> but some examples of that would be how, how you might view gun control or the lack of gun control. Uh, how you might view freedom of speech or freedom of religion, uh, how you might view the immigration crisis. These are all things that, when I said them, you instantly thought about, probably, you instantly thought about how you feel on, a certain, on those certain things. And that's fine. Again, I'm not trying to, you know, whatever. I'm just simply saying that, that as Americans, we're going to have some issues that are in our subconscious that when we're reading the Bible... We're going to instantly go to that. And in, in a lot of cases, we're going to um, kind of uh, retranslate even as we're reading. Okay? So a good example of that would be uh, how Jesus talked about um, giving to the poor. How Paul talked about how if you don't work, then you don't eat. And so now we're, we're instantly redirecting that in our head. Well, yeah, but I mean, what if you're handicapped, and what if, you know, you've got special needs, and all that, you know what I mean? And it's not that those things are right or wrong, it's just simply in our American culture, we instantly redirect what the Bible is saying about something. And I think that that's obviously a, a danger, because if, you're, if, if your mind is redirecting a verse, and you can't understand what it meant to them, once again, you can't understand what it means to you now. And it's okay to have ideas on, you know, the American ideas. Ideals, that's totally fine, just as long as you're able to allow yourself to be changed with what Scripture says. So pre-understanding, a big problem of that is that it fills in the gaps and the blanks. If you look at Matthew 18, uh, 20, it says this. Excuse me. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. So out of context, 
a lot of Christians quote this to talk about how in prayer for anything, two Christians get together, God's going to answer. Even though nowhere else in all of Scripture does God give this requirement. So that's obviously a problem right there. Then the second thing is, what is the surrounding context? Well, most of us don't know. I mean, obviously the people who are here on Wednesday nights know it's talking about correcting somebody in sin. But the problem with pre-understanding is that you fill in the gaps and blanks with this is probably what it is. Uh, for instance, after I taught on Matthew 18, there was a person who came up to me and said, well, everything in that passage is completely invalid because of the Holy Spirit. And obviously there's multiple issues wrong with that idea. First off, it was written after the Holy Spirit was given. Second off, just because we have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that there's not an authority structure in the church. I mean, when you speed down the road, you're going to get pulled over by a cop. And whether you have the Holy Spirit or not, he's still going to give you a ticket. Like, that's a reality of life. And uh, you can't simply dismiss something because of your pre-understanding. And unfortunately, that's what was happening with this person. Is they're reading a passage and instantly dismissing it because they already had their mind made up. Be aware of these kinds of things because we all have them. One, good, one way you can get past them is by studying. Just keep on reading the Bible. Another way is by talking with other people about the Bible. Another way is by going to church. You can watch online. There's a lot of different, um, you know, good people to watch online that they have a lot of stuff to say. Uh, one of the ones I like, his name is Mike Winger. He's on YouTube. But anyways, uh, so a good example of pre-understanding and how we kind of fill in the blanks is whenever you talk about Jonah and the well, right, the prophet Jonah, he's swallowed by a fish is what it says. So right now, we're like, well, scientifically, it was a well. Okay, Jonah was swallowed by a well. I mean, it says fish, but whatever, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, it was a large fish, so a fish, so we can say, say it was a well. But what was it like inside of that fish well? What was it like in there? Well, in our minds, we probably think of like on Pinocchio. He's sitting inside fishing with the boat behind him and... All the rubble. That's not what the inside of a well looks like, guys, let alone a fish. So, I mean, it's going to be a lot more cramped. It's going to be probably very scary. And it's probably going to be a divine miracle just him being alive in that thing for three days. I'm just, I, I don't know much about fish. I'm not like a biologist or something. But I'm assuming that to be alive underwater in a fish of any size for three days is quite the miracle. Uh, but in our minds, we see that scene from Pinocchio. Did you notice that you were doing it? Um, some other things that play into that come into play with culture, your family history. Um, um, other ethnic history skew, can skew your views. Uh, if you grow up poor and how you interact with the rich, that's going to obviously have an have a impact. Um, especially if you grew up poor and you read different passages, you're going to see it as like a, a, a treatise against wealth. Um, if you uh, pay tithes, in, in America, there's this idea that if you pay tithes, you're going to be provided for, which is fine. A lot of circles, it's something along the lines of you will, uh, basically by giving in tithes, you're going to have wealth and abundance, which is not fine, because that's not what it's saying. But uh, with that being said, one of the things that, that kind of, a little bit of a culture shark, a shock is with paying tithes, God talks about the way that you won't starve. Whereas in third world countries, you have Christians starving to death. And so how would you just preach that same verse to those who are starving to death? See what I mean? And if it's not something that can apply to all cultures, it's probably not what the idea was in the text. Um, so <clears throat> just some examples of how, how, how we can kind of redirect there. Um, another example I like to use quite frequently, God being the father, but if you didn't have a father in your life or you didn't have a good father in your life, that isn't really a, a, an idea of comfort. <laughs> it's more of an idea of judgment, um, especially if you had like more of an abusive relationship with your father, and then you go and God calls himself a father, and you're like, eesh, and kind of rubs a little bit wrong. Not, not that you can't understand, but it just is it's harder. Um, another thing, think about how when you're talking to kids about turning the other cheek, right? But what's one of the things that we tell them to do to, to, to bullies? There's only one way to deal with a bully. You punch him in the face. And he stops. But yet, is that cohesive with what Jesus said about turning the other cheek? Well, no, not really. But in our, our culture, we have this idea of, hey, you rise up against a bully, remove the problem, and there will be no problem. 
but was that really what Jesus was getting at? And then, you, so then, not that I'm saying that you shouldn't address bullies, but, but it kind of should. You should it could cause you. It should cause you to stop and think for a minute. Like, eh, is this does this apply to bullies? Or is he talking about something else entirely? Is this a principle? So you I mean, and, and if you're if you're kind of struggling with it, that's the idea that I want to get across. Uh, Romans 13 is a very lengthy verse. I'm not going to read all of it, but. It starts out, let everyone submit to the governing authorities since there is no authority except from God. And the authorities exist are instituted by God. So he goes on this, on this very, very lengthy thing. And it's important to remember that back then they didn't vote. The emperor simply was. And if he decided to, I don't know, uh, crucify Christians down the street and light them on fire, which he did, uh, tell luck. There's nothing you can really do to stop that. Whereas in today's world, <laughs> we have a totally different idea towards the president and other things, and it just gets to be a little bit of a touchy subject. And the question then becomes, when Paul's talking like this about the authorities, where does that leave us as Americans with the Boston Tea Party? Was that an immoral thing for us to do? Was it a Christian thing for us to do? Not, Once again, not, crit not critiquing, simply pointing something out of how are we going to address that from a scriptural, biblical perspective. Um, I mean, if you... I, obviously, you probably already have your mind made up one way or the other about whether it was good or bad. But the moral of the story being um, there is a conflict with scripture there. So, why do these questions upset us? Well, hmm. What things am I filtering from the Bible? That's why it upsets us is because we're filtering things when we read the Bible. Um, and there is no such thing as total objectivity. There's a lot of people who think you, you can't understand something if you, unless you can attain perfect objectivity completely wrong. Um, you shouldn't even try to have uh, objectivity. And that brings us to something called presuppositions. And I'm going to kind of contrast the two between pre-understanding pre and presuppositions. But presuppositions basically are good biases that you should have when you read the Bible. It's things that you get as you grow in your knowledge of God. So some examples, um, the Bible is God's word. That is a presupposition. Um, the, the Bible is uh, inerrant and infallible. That is a uh, presupposition. Jesus is God, and, and when I'm reading the Bible, this is, that's going to relate how I understand that. That's a, pre, that's a presupposition. Those are all good. Presuppositions relate to all the Bible, not a specific passage. This is my view of the Bible. Presuppositions shouldn't change. They should be something where as you're reading the Bible, that this is what you believe about the Bible. It is God's word. That's what you, what you should, those shouldn't change. It also should result from some sort of spiritual maturity. The more you're studying, the more you're, you know, uh, learning about God. I am convinced that the Bible is God's word because... So it should be something that's kind of results as you mature. Uh, Pre-understanding on the other side is it relates to specific. So you read a passage in scripture and you instantly dismiss it because we're uh, we're more intelligent than they were back then, and so we have more scientific knowledge, and so we can just dismiss it. Uh, Pre-understanding should always change. Pre-understanding should be something where it's not a golden calf in your life. You can you can go to a passage and say, I might be wrong in how I view this. Um, I brought up a couple weeks ago, maybe it was last week, I brought up the verse about um, if my people are called by my name and how that does not apply to America, but rather to us as Christians. And that's something that you should challenge your belief on, on verses like that. Um, Pre-understanding is ideas that we bring to the Bible. So I believe this, therefore, when I read this, I'm just going to read into that. We have, uh, we have a, a world of social welfare, uh, social welfare and different things like that that was foreign to Jesus' world. <clears throat> okay, so that takes us to what is context? Context is, and we're going to look at this later, context is basically... how it fits together. And we'll build on that in just a second. So God spoke in context. When he spoke, he was speaking to people in specific situations at specific times. There was a context there. And he spoke in that context. We, on our end, have to understand the context to understand the message. We have to understand the context to understand the message. So in other words, uh, we have to understand why it was said to understand what was said. 
Um, 2 Timothy 4.9 says, Make every effort to come to me soon. Make ev- and then in verse 21, Make every effort to come before winter. You bella screech you as do pundas, and you go on to the, to the different names there. But here's the idea here. Paul is getting ready to die. He is aware that he is getting ready to die. This is the end of the road for him. He's totally aware. Now, something's about to happen in winter, uh, and, the, and the thing that's about to happen is that they're about to close the shipping lanes, which means any trip that he had planned is about to be shut down as well. So what Paul is saying is he's saying, look, I'm about to die. Before I go, try to get here, because if you can't get here before winter, you're not going to see me again before I die. This is literally a plea from a father to a son to make haste, <laughs> to quickly come and see me. Um, well, if you are not aware of the context, then that doesn't, it kind of loses its, its meaning. You're just kind of reading through those verses and you think, ah, whatever. Um, scripture is God's word to other people before it's God's word to us. You can't go to the Bible and say, okay, the Bible is God's word, therefore I don't have to pay attention to any of the history of it, any of the prequel. I can just, it's like reading a book and starting on chapter 30 something. I mean, just, you're, you're going to have no idea what's going on, um, which is a whole discussion in and of itself. But I'm going to give you a couple examples. Jeremiah 29, 11. Everybody likes to talk about this, especially at, at graduations. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. What's the context of that, of that verse? Well, Israel had been living in sin. Because of that, God brought punishment. They lost their homeland, the homeland that God said will be yours forever. He took it away. So that brings up a lot of questions. Is God a liar? Did he give up on us? Is there hope for us? I don't know. Here we are in this limbo, and I have no idea what's going on. Did did we mess up so bad that God no longer loves us, that he no longer cares? Is that what we did? And so then you have in the middle of that, they're in exile, and Jeremiah the prophet says, for I know the plans that I have for you. In other words, I did this on purpose. I know what's happening. I know where I'm taking you. And even though you are suffering for something that you did, I'm not done with you. That's a very powerful message. Especially, remember, they're struggling with all these questions. I thought God would never abandon us. Why has he abandoned us? Very big questions that they were struggling with. Then uh, the book of Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk starts like this. The prophet says, God, why are you doing nothing about all these evil people? And then God says this, I'm going to do something. I'm going to bring people who are even more wicked than them. And the prophet says, this is chapter 2. Are you, what? Uh, not to tell you your business, but um, why in the world are you using people more wicked than us? They're the ones who need the punishment. And God says, yep, and I'm going to bring it through them, and then I'm going to punish them afterwards. This is a dialogue that Habakkuk is having with God, back and forth. Well, if you understand that it's a dialogue between God and the prophet, it's a lot easier to understand. If you're reading it and not not paying attention to that, it just kind of gets confusing. Um, The New Testament letters, Ephesians, Colossians, all of them, they were written to address the situation. All of them were written because there was an issue that the church was going through, and so Paul or somebody else wrote that letter to address it. The Gospels. The Gospels were not written to all people. Each gospel was written to a specific audience. Luke has much more of a Greek slant. Uh, it's, it's very well written and obviously a professional uh, document. Then you have Mark, which is much more rushed, uh, much shorter, obviously not written to Greeks, probably written to Romans, and kind of written with the idea of being able to be carried around. So you have more of a, a, less of a professional idea with Mark and more of an accessible idea with Mark. See, they were written for different people at, in, in different, different audiences, basically. They're all telling the story of Jesus, but just in a different way. So like if you, if you read uh, Luke, he's going to talk about the story when um, the person is lowered down through the ceiling. He's going to talk about the roof being uh, the shingles, because that's the kind of stuff that they use there. But then in Matthew, he's not going to talk about it being shingles. He's going to talk about it being um, hay, like straw. Uh, They they dug through the straw. Well, a contradiction, it can't be both and. Well, no, not really. He's just putting it in terms that they'll understand. I I would probably do the same thing, but back then, that's how they wrote. (laughs) That's how they did it. He stayed faithful to the writing style of the time. You can't expect him to write by today's standards, 
especially since today's standards are probably going to change anyways. Um, so, there's another passage, and my mom used to bring this up all, all as a kid. She, she said about the, the part where it says, for this reason, a husband is to leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. And she said, and it doesn't say anything about the woman. And I said, Mom, <laughs> that's because at that time in history, the woman was already expected to do that. All that it's saying is that the husband should do the exact same thing and be united with his wife instead of letting his parents kind of get in on that relationship. You see what I mean? It doesn't mean either or. Yes, the husband and the wife should both leave and cleave. That's, that's kind of the idea there. Uh, not either or, both and. But once again, if you're not understanding that it's something that is already expected, you're not going to get it. Um, for instance, the New Testament talks about husband and wife, right? Wife, submit to your husband. Totally common. All the law codes of the day said that. But then it goes on to say something else. Husbands, love your wife even as Christ loved the church. Holy smokes, that's not what we believe. You need to calm down with that, Paul. Uh, the wife's supposed to cater to me, and it's all supposed to be I'm the final, the, the buck stops here. you know. And it's not the idea that Paul's getting across, but he's relating to something from the ancient world to help them relate it to their experience. Well, if you don't know that, you're going to read the Bible a little bit differently once again. So uh, there's a series of questions uh, that, that you need to ask when you're at this stage, and I've written most of them on your, uh, on your sheet, so you don't have to write these down. Who was the author? What is the background of the book? When was it written? How does the author relate to the audience? Uh, why was he writing? Who was he writing? What were the circumstances that he was writing about? What, were the, what was their relationship with God? Uh, what was their relationship with each other? For instance, in the book of, I think it's Philippians, there's um, a little bit of a tiff going on in the church between these two women. Uh, what is happening historically? Uh, what cultural or historical details may help us understand the book? Um, in Hebrews, we're doing a study on Wednesday nights, and I'm going to bring up quite a few things that are relevant to the study that are going on in history in the world. So... Uh, it also, in your, in, your, in your pamphlet, I gave you from the very start of the class a resource sheet uh, that uh, will help you get started in your Bible studies. But there are also other things such as handbooks, Bible handbooks, uh, atlases, uh, <clears throat> different culture study books. And, and there's a lot of different stuff there that you could go to. If you need any help with that, just ask me and I can refer you to a couple books. You just got to tell me what you're looking for. Um, there's a story that was kind of amusingly told uh, back in college. And the, the story goes that there's this young man that's trying to find God's will for his life. He's struggling with a situation. He wants to know what God has to say. So he says, God, direct me. And he opens up the Bible and it says, he points at a random verse and it says, this went and hung himself. So he says, okay. So he okay, flips down this spot and points. And it says, uh, go and do likewise. So his message from God was, Judas went and hung himself, go and do likewise. See, that's the danger of context. If you don't pay attention to why it was written, <laughs> you can literally come out with anything. Obviously, God doesn't want us to go and hang ourselves. Uh, obviously, but you know, if you, if you follow that kind of mysticalism, like, oh, God's will, I don't have to read and understand the Bible, I can just... You see, a lot of people do this, just open the Bible randomly and they just read a paragraph. Hmm, I'll chew on this. And there's, there's nothing wrong with reading a paragraph at a time. But you really need to understand what's going on in that paragraph. Why is this written? What is, what is, what is happening here? So I would recommend starting at the beginning of a book when you're doing a Bible study. And uh, maybe read it through a couple times. Uh, before you look at... Um, let me see if it's on here. Uh, before you look at what a passage means... You need to look at how it means. Before you look at what it means, you need to look at how it means. And we're going to look in a couple weeks about the genres in the Bible, like poetry and that kind of stuff. But for now, what I want to say is, not all of Scripture is written to be understood literal. It's not all literal. I'll give you an example right off the top of my head. The book of Proverbs is Proverbs, not commands, not promises. So it says, for instance, well, let me say this. Proverbs are principles that are proven true over time. Generally speaking, this is true. 
So, for instance, it says, raise a child in the way that he should go, and when they're older, they're not going to depart from it. That doesn't mean that every single time that a Christian has a kid, that that Christian is never going to leave the faith. That's not what that means at all. It simply means that, by and large, when you instruct your child of how to do their life, they'll usually stick with it. You know, they'll, they'll kind of get the idea of, okay, well, this is how you handle your finances. This is how you treat people. They kind of follow suit. You know what I mean? Uh, not to say that, obviously, you have to choose their faith for them. Don't let them ask any questions. Don't ever let them have any doubts. And never have an honest conversation about the faith. Because you should be doing that. Your kids are going to have doubts. They're going to have struggles. They're going to say, how does this apply to the world? And when that happens, you can let them be honest and work through them with the process. They have to discover their own faith. They can't always live off your faith. That's one of those things. But we go to that verse and we say, okay, well, because the Bible says this, I don't have to worry about the rest of it. And that's not what God has in mind. You do still have to let your kids struggle to find um, God in their life. So it's not all literal, and you have to understand that. There's a bit of a philosophical dilemma that was brought up in one of the classes that I was teaching a number of years back. And in this idea, uh, there was a philosopher that, that brought up the idea of when you see somebody's shadow, like there's a fire and you see their shadow on the wall, and how you can't really ever know the details of that person. And his main argument was that you, you can't really fully understand God, because you're going to understand him in a different light than he actually is. And there is truth to that. When you see God for real, it, there's going to be a lot of things different than how you thought it was. And you're going to be learning about him for eternity. There's never going to be a moment where you're going to like, I understand God fully. But in our minds, we kind of think, well, I have a pretty good idea of God. And so he had, did have a point. The problem is, is that... Um, you can get pretty close to what the image was. Like, for instance, I can tell that that image on the wall is still a human. You know what I mean? Just because I can't see all of the things about that shape. So the idea that he was trying to get is that no, there is no such thing as absolute knowable truth. And if there was no such thing as absolute knowable truth, then why would God have spoken to us? Hebrews says, as he has spoken before through the prophets, now he has spoken through his son. Why would he speak if the content of his words were, un, un, you couldn't understand them? Well, obviously, he, God is operating from the stand that you can understand, even if you don't completely have full understanding. Like, even the prophets of the Old Testament didn't completely have full understanding. But you can still get the basic idea of what's being said. So, uh, I, I, especially nowadays, we live in a time when truth is completely unknowable, a lot of people think. Uh, and I just want to encourage you, it is knowable, but there's just room for improvement. That's all there is to it. So, the context is, um, the context, uh, well, let me say this. I have given you the sheet here, and it says um, surrounding context. The, the context starts with the immediate and then it goes outwards. So it starts with like passage and then immediate context, like maybe the, sen the paragraph around it or the sentence around it, rest of the larger section, uh, rest of the book, rest of the Bible. That's how you discover the context. So if you're trying to understand the context of John 3.16, you don't want to go to Matthew. You want to go to John 3.15 and John 3.17. Okay, I mean, you want to see the surrounding idea. Then you want to read John 3. Then you want to read maybe John 1 through 5. So I mean, then you want to read John. See what I mean? And that kind of helps you understand what the context is uh, of what's going on there. Uh, think of these different passages and see if you know what their, what their um, context is. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares. What is being said? What, how does it relate to the rest of the book? Off the top of your head, you probably don't know. Why? Because we remember the, the, the parts, not the whole um, I, I know for myself, I, I even forget what book that's in. Probably, probably, probably First Peter, if I had to guess. But I don't know that. Um, it's just a guess. What is the context? What is the argument of the book? By paying attention to the context, and by paying, and paying attention to the intent of the of the book, uh, you prevent that. That's how you prevent forcing the Bible to say something it didn't mean to say. If you ignore the context, you ignore the intent, then you, you, uh, you end up 
just ignoring scripture and, and twisting it. Uh, another, here's another verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's the context of that? You hear people mention it when they go for their workouts. Does it relate to that or does it not? Uh, does it relate to your cup of coffee in the morning? It's interesting. You know, it's one of those things that everybody quotes it, but nobody really thinks about it. Um, I already mentioned the passage about where two or three come together in my name. I already mentioned that one. Uh, what about Revelation 3.20, which says, See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Most of us are thinking about how this applies to the people in the world. But this was actually written to a group of Christians. A group of Christians who are becoming what, what he calls as lukewarm and how he's about to spit them out, that's, uh, throw them up. Like when you eat something and it's gross and it sits wrong on your stomach and you throw up. That's the idea here. He's about to throw them up. So it doesn't really have much as we see it with the context of the world. It has more to do with uh, Christians. Uh, you see the same kind of danger happening when, when people preach or teach topically. So I want to talk about this idea, anger, for instance. And so I'm going to take these verses that are going to support that idea. And the problem is, is that you kind of, it's, it's very hard not to go out of context with the verses to support a different idea than the verse was originally written to talk about. See, John's fault, let's say John, for instance, has this idea in his argument. And so then you say, well, I'm going to take this thought, and then this book, thought from this other person, this is going to be my conclusion. So you're, you're stealing from their flow of argument without even understanding it. That's, that's a danger. Anytime you're writing a lesson or anything like that, you want to always make sure, what's the bigger context of the verse that I'm quoting? So for the context, you want to identify um, how sentences and parts of the book fit the whole. How do the parts fit into the whole? Um, and, and that's kind of how you stay... Um, how you stay in context, in context, I mean. Um, so this is a three-step process. Uh, you, first off, you find, uh, you find how the book is divided into the sections. And you can do this yourself. You read through the book, you just divide it into sections. Uh, the second step, you summarize the main idea of each section. And then the third step, you find out how those how the passage you're relating, re, reading relates to the sections that you just did. Uh, and so a, anybody can do this. You're reading a passage, you want to find out. Read the whole book, separate the book into, into sections, uh, g give a summary of each of those sections, kind of the flow of the thoughts here. So in this section, Moses is saying this. In this section, Moses is saying this. In this section, Israel is doing this. And then you kind of just, how does this fit together? And how does my section fit into that flow? And it's just a really simple, easy tool to help you uh, draw context to a book. And I'll give you a good example right here from Philemon. I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Well, this sounds really good, but we're, we're tempted to just kind of flip through. Like, it's not, not really that big of a deal. But if you pay attention to the book of Philemon, this is what's happening. He gives an introduction, and he introduces himself as a, if I remember correctly, as a slave of Christ. And then he goes to this section where he is uh, giving thanksgiving to this to this fellow Christian. And then he goes on right after this verse to basically ask him, hey, you had this slave. I think this slave's name is uh, Onesimus, if I remember correctly. And the slave ran away from his master. And Paul ran into him in Rome, and he got saved. And so Paul sent him back to his master with this letter and saying, hey, he wasn't previously of any benefit to you, but he's become of great benefit to me. So I am hoping that you can forgive him and let this go. We can and look, this is how he this is how he leads up to his request. May, uh, may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your, your love. So he's getting ready to make his request. Uh, it's not that he's being, you know, manipulative or anything like that, but he is um, Addressing him very wisely <laughs> because he does have the right to, you know, do as he will with this guy. 
And uh, so now you understand what the what the book's intent is. That passage has a lot more meaning to it. And if you read through it again, you're like, okay, I see what he's getting at here. Um, so um, we're pretty much out of time because I started late because of the prayer. It's up to you guys. We can keep going or stop there. Whatever. Who wants to stop here? It is six o'clock. Nobody. Who wants to keep going? Okay. Okay, we're going to keep going, but whenever I've gone too far, you just let me know. Uh, there are some dangers of, um, of looking at context. Uh, three specific things I'm going to mention, okay? The first danger is inaccurate Bible information. This is extremely common. Um, you see people mention this, uh, well, if you're ever on YouTube, you're going to see it. But um, one of the things people say is shalom. Okay, there's a lot of people who know nothing about Hebrew, but then they want to become fountains of of Hebrew knowledge, like they actually know something. And one of the ways that they do that is the word shalom. Uh, They they make it a real mystical idea, and they say, hey, it means all of its possible interpretations. So shalom doesn't just mean peace. It means wholeness and entire wellness of being. It means health to your bones and spiritual strength. And all. It's like, well, calm down, calm down. Shalom generally means peace, just peace. Like, hey, peace on you. Shalom to you, friend. Uh, But it can also have a lot of other different interpretations. For instance, in Jeremiah, God says, the entire nation of you I'm upset with. I'm going to kill the entire nation of you. And the word that is translated entire nation or all of you uh, is shalom. Shalom means, uh, can mean wholeness, the entire of the the group. The shalom of us here are learning about the meaning of shalom. <laughs> you see what I mean? Uh, and, and so the problem is that people go to, go to concordance and they say, okay, it has all these possible uses, so I'm going to take all those possible uses and make them one, and it always means all of these things. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. That's a huge danger of word studies, and just not a good place to be in. Um, <clears throat> there's another thing. People say, in, there, there's, Jesus is telling this story, and it says, it is harder for a rich person to go through the eye of a needle than it is uh, for a, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of an angel than it is for a rich man to, you know, so on and so forth, enter the kingdom of God. And this is the idea there that people say that there is supposedly a little skinny gate that is called the camel's gate, that at nighttime they would, you know, be able to sneak through there or whatever. Here's the thing, there is no archaeological evidence for a camel's gate. That simply does not exist. He was simply saying that it is it's really hard for a rich person to get saved. That's all that he was saying. Like, you, you don't have to make up our, um, archaeological ideas. I mean, it's just, it, it's not there. Uh, so this would be a good example of inaccurate uh, Bible information. You, you find a lot of people on YouTube, Facebook, and stuff who call themselves rabbis or apostles. Whenever you see somebody call themselves a rabbi or apostle, be very, very hesitant. <laughs> Tread carefully. Because typically, nine out of ten times, it's just hogwash. That's all it is. There's nothing to it. Like, uh, just because I stick rabbi on the front of my name doesn't mean I know everything about everything Jewish. (laughs) It just doesn't exist. Uh, And just because I call myself an apostle doesn't mean that I have uh, this voice of the Holy Spirit, okay? Like, really, it's it's gotten ridiculous uh, out there. There's a book that came out uh, a number of years back. It was called, maybe it wasn't that long ago, it was called Return of the Gods. Have you guys ever heard of it? Kind of, maybe, Return of the Gods? It was written by this guy, I believe he refers to himself as a rabbi, but um, it is what I would define as speculative studies. So it, it claims to be regarding scripture, but then it's not really in-depth on the scripture part. It's more like he uses the scriptures as a springboard to say what he already wants to say. And most of his books are like that. Um, there's another one he wrote, Harbinger and stuff. It's not that everything in there is trash. That's not what I'm saying at all. And I'm sure he has, you know, he's a nice person. I'm sure he has a lot of good things to say. But by and large, you have to stop and ask yourself, is this what Scripture was originally trying to say? Because if you take it and you say, okay, now I'm a rabbi, so I know everything about the ancient biblical text. And I'm going to take this one thing, and even though this is not what it's talking about, I have this whole theory that I'm going to look at. That's just not a good place to be in. Hypothetically, could he be right about Oh, yeah, absolutely, hypothetically. But the, the question that we're trying to understand is, is this helping me understand Scripture? Is it helping me focus on Jesus? Or am I focusing on this, this guy's ideas? Um, I, when I was in college, there was this guy, um, what was his name? Real famous end times guy. 
Um, maybe John Hagee. John Hagee, that was the guy's name. John Hagee, I'm sure you guys have heard of him. Real famous guy. He's actually a G, if I remember correctly. And um, uh, he had this whole, he had had the end times completely figured out. No. <laughs> There's no such thing as having the end times completely figured out. Uh, it's one of those things where you'll know when it happens. And, um, you know, I, I'm more power to the guy. I'm, I'm happy that he is doing what he loves. Uh, but that's just, it's speculative. Like, you can't, he takes one thing and just kind of runs wild with it. And any time that you, say, you hear somebody say, I have it completely figured out about the end times, they're wrong. Remember that guy in the 80s? He said, this, I, I have figured out when Jesus is going to come back. Even though Jesus said, nobody knows the hour, not even myself. <laughs> No, I've got it figured out. I remember 2,000 Reasons for the, for the Year 2000. Is that what the name of the book was? You guys remember that one? Or was it uh, 85 Reasons for the Year 1985? I forget. Anyways, more of the story. He had it all figured out, and obviously he was wrong because we're still here. And uh, the idea that I'm trying to get across is watch out for inaccurate Bible information. Just because something sounds good doesn't mean that it is good. And you can like a rabbi's teachings, you can like an apostle's teachings, but make sure that you don't put it above Scripture where when he says something, you say, that's what this Scripture means. But instead you say, that's interesting. Let's see what this Bible Scripture has to say. Let, let's just see. And all I'm saying is go to the Scripture first. Go to the Scripture first. That's it. Um, same thing if you read commentaries. Go to the Bible before you read the commentary. Just because it made it into a book doesn't mean it's right. The second danger of, of context studies is preoccupation with background information. This is where it'll be Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Okay, so let's learn about the Pharisees. And five days later, you're still studying about the Pharisees. And you have not come any deeper to the knowledge of what Jesus was saying in the passage. You, you have no greater understanding of the Bible, but you know a bunch of stuff about the Pharisees from five days worth of, the Bible, worth of uh, background studies. I mean, that's, imp that's interesting, but it's not something where... Basically, the idea here is don't lose the forest for the trees. So, and then real closely associated with that one is encyclopedia syndrome. This is the one that I became guilty of. This is why I stopped reading the Bible when I was younger. Because I knew everything, a, a bunch of facts about the Bible. And the Bible had nothing more interesting to teach me, so I was just, I was done. There's nothing, no reason for me to keep on reading it over and over again. It's a dangerous area to be in. You become a walking uh, fountain of, of, of facts that just doesn't really have, um, it becomes the end, not a means to an end. So, um, and the idea here is really be changed by Scripture. The last thing I want to say, the last thing I want to say is, is about word studies. Now, now, there is a, uh, a resource I want to make, oh, make you aware of. It's called Greek for the Rest of Us. It's by a guy named Bill Mounts. He has been associated with the NIV, the ESV, and some other uh, translation stuff there for a number of years. Uh, he is knowledgeable on the subject. He has, his book is the current standard in Greek studies. It's called um, Basics of Biblical Greek. Uh, he is a you know, obviously a good source on the, on the material. Uh, and he has a book of studies, and he does online stuff for it too, uh, called Greek for the Rest of Us. Um, if you are interested in learning how to do your own word studies from the Bible, I'd point you there. Um, because we just don't have enough time for me to teach you how to do it well. I just would like to point you out there. But there are seven uh, specific mistakes that people, or yeah, let's say mistakes, that people do with, it, with their word studies that I want to point out uh, just to make sure that you don't follow that same error. Um, uh, these are mostly adapted from a book by... D, no, D.A. Carson. That's his name, D.A. Carson. Uh, the name of the book is, uh, I think it's Fallacies of Greek Translation, maybe? I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to look that one up, but I'm pretty sure it's D.A. Carson. I'm, I'm like 99% sure. Uh, the first common mistake is word studies in English. You want to understand the Bible more so you get it in your head. I'm going to do a study uh, of the English translation, basically. I'm not going to find the original word. I'm going to do a study of the word. Well, the, there, there's a lot of problems with that. The first problem is that one word is often translated to English with many words, and vice versa. Uh, many different words can be translated to the same English word. OK? 
Okay? So like, let's say you have this Greek word. It can be any Greek word. And there's going to be a lot of different English words that it translates into. Okay? Uh, uh, logos, word, statement, message, something that's written, um, like a note, letter more like. All those possible translations. And the same thing vice versa. You have all these Greek words or Hebrew or Aramaic. You have all these words and maybe all of them translate into the exact same English word. See what I mean? So obviously you, you see the, air, the problem here. You can't just um, shortchange the subject and say, well, let's just see what this English word has to say. The best word studies involve the original word, not the translated word. Um, I'm going to make you aware of something. I've mentioned this before. There's a book called Vine's Expository Dictionary. If you own this, destroy it. It is a complete waste of your time. It has not very good information. It'll just kind of... Uh, it's, not, it's not worth your time or your money. A better option is uh, called Mounts' Complete Expository Dictionary. It's much better. and it has, uh, But it doesn't have a, a, a complete list of all the words. Um, just the ones who, which occur, I think, over 20 times or something. So if you want to know what that is, I'll tell you. You can just come ask me afterwards. The second common word study mistake is that people try to find real meaning uh, of the word by tracing its root. This is very deceptive. Think of the word butterfly. Let's say butterfly is, is a Greek word. And so you're looking in your Bible, you see that it, the word translated comes from the Greek word butterfly. You're like, okay, I want to learn what this word means, so I'm going to study its roots. Well, is butterfly literally made from butter and a fly? You can understand what butter means. You can understand what fly means. It doesn't mean you, you, you can really get it. Uh, number, the, third, the third common word study mistake, when you define the word incorrectly from a different time. Dunamos is a Greek word which means power. Obviously, it became dynamite in English. So you are tempted to say something along the lines of this. Well, God's power is dynamite. No, that's, you're mixing up the time there. It didn't mean dynamite back then. It meant power. Dunamis. So kind of one of those things where, where it's really important to pay attention to when the word was used. So uh, you're, not, you're not trying to define the word from a different time. Uh, number four, thinking the word means all of its possible definitions at the exact same time. And I already mentioned this about shalom, but I'd like to give a second example of the Amplified Bible. This is why I do not advise people to read the Amplified Bible. What it does is it says like three or four possible ways that that can be said, but the problem is, is in translations it doesn't mean all those at the same time. Um, the, fifth, uh, the fifth common word study mistake is thinking that the word means something in one verse because it is used that way in another verse. So let me say that differently. Because this word is translated this way over here, it should always be translated that exact same way. That's not true. Context governs translation. It, it, because once again, the same word can mean multiple different things. Once again, I'd like to bring up this example of the word run. What does it mean to run? You can run a business. You can run outside. You can, you know, so there's all kinds of different ideas that the word is, run is used. You can't translate it the same way in every single context because there's different contexts. You have to, you have to take into account. And this is one thing that cults like the Jehovah's Witness do, is they, they take words and they say it, it has to be translated this every single time. But that's not attainable. Like, if you read through their translation, they try very, very hard to do it. But then in some spots, they still mess up and translate it with a different word. Uh, it's just not possible. Um, the sixth, uh, sixth wor word study mistake is thinking you understand a concept entirely because you understand one word. Like, let's say you're trying to understand the concept of the church in the Bible. So you're going to use the word that is often translated to the church, which is ecclesia, um, which just means congregation or body. So because I understand the word ecclesia really, really good, I've studied it really, really hard, I therefore know everything about the church. No, there's a lot of other terms that he uses, that the Bible uses about the church, except for that one single word. You don't think that you understand everything about something just because you understand one word. Um, and then the last one I want to mention, number seven, be very careful about focusing on one 
uh, on the evidence that supports your interpretation and dismissing anything else. Um, a good example of this is, well, maybe not the best example of this, but a good example is we all know the Ten Commandments, and it says in there, thou shalt not lie, right? Everybody knows that. But lie is not a very good translation. It's more of uh, tell falsehood. And the, the difference being that in the Ten Commandments, he's not talking about lying generally. Not that you should lie, but in the Ten Commandments, the words that are used there kind of seem to imply he's talking about in court, don't give false testimony. That's kind of the, the idea behind the word. In most of your English translations, it's just going to say don't lie. But once again, that's not really what it has, what it's really talking about. Once again, not saying that you should lie, <laughs> but it's talking about harmful slander about, about a person that's going to you know, really have a big, a big impact. Whereas in Exodus, the midwives lie, and God rewards them for it. Or in the book of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah lies. So you have a lot of different times in the Bible where it's not so black and white as thou shalt not lie. So, you know, one of these things where you really have to kind of weigh it, and um, you don't want to come to your conclusion too quickly. I'm sure that this is what it means. And then just, like, write off any other possibility. So for a good word study, um, there, there's really a three-step process, and I'll try to say it in a way that makes sense, um, since obviously I'm trying to finish things up here. Uh, first off, you pick a word. Um, to find out what that word is in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, look up in a concordance. Um, so you, concordance, concordances are done to the translation you're using. So if you're in the NIV, you get an NIV concordance. And then you look in there, and it'll say, like, a number for the word. And you look up the word, uh, that, that number. You look up that number, and it'll show you what word is being used. And so that shows you, shows you the word. That's step one. Pick the word. Step two is find out what it could mean. What are all the different ideas behind that word that are possible? You're finding, well, you remember this a couple weeks ago. We, called the, we, we talked about the semantic range, the range of words that it could possibly mean. That's what you're trying to discover. What can this word mean? And then you, you can look at an index or a, lex, or a lexicon. Uh, this is going to say, you know, give you all the different places where that word occurs. It's going to say the different translations of the word. It's going to say different stuff like that. And you can kind of get a better idea of it there. Then once you've done that, you can move on to step three, which is where you're determining what the word does mean. You're not just finding out what it could mean. Now you're moving to what it does mean. And uh, for that... Um, you're going to have to look at other verses where it's used, and you're going to have to pay attention to the context. And you're going to say, in this context, this word most likely means this. Um, but it's not always that easy. Uh, for instance, the, the writer of the books, John, John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, he has this way of when he, when he writes where he'll use words in a sentence, and the way he uses them, they have two possible interpretations. And sometimes it means both of those interpretations. But in your English, it's only going to have one of the interpretations, which is frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, so it's not always as, as easy as, as what, I, what I'm making out to be. So, uh, And then when, you, when you're doing this, remember you can compare major translations. So let's say you're reading it in an NIV. Well, look at what, how the other translations word it. And the last thing is, really remember that context will always determine the meaning. It determines the meanings of the verses, of the words, the sentences. If it doesn't fit the context, it's wrong. And it's one of those things where you have to really pay attention to what's being said and why it's being said. 